that's cool bird right there. So you see that guy walking through the lily pads? That's a gallinule. They're related to moorhens. They have these really long toes that allows them to walk on lily pads. Oh, see, oh, that's a full grown firefly. Like, look, those are the seeds and they hang up there so birds can get them. My name is Sean Patton and I run Stalking Savvy Environmental Consulting. We do environmental consulting for politicians, businesses, HOAs, and then we also help people do habitat restoration projects, pond stalking, sort of whatever environmental project needs to be done, especially if it relates to lakes and wetlands. Um, otherwise, I work with a ton of other local businesses, depending on where I'm at, to do other projects such as upland restoration, pond planting, fish stalking. I try to get local sources whenever I can. If you look down here, a lot of people will think that you just need plants in the water or you know plants up at the surface and you can have this like grass area right to the edge of the pond. But if you look down, you'll notice that there's no grass going to the edge. In fact, there are these other water plants that are trying to take root, but there's too much erosion and they're falling in. You want a nice, smooth, gradual slope into the pond. If you try to do this and get more land into the pond, it'll simply erode away. And if you actually look up and down the bank, you'll see that where the trees are and the roots that are holding back the erosion, tree roots and big plants like that one right there are the main things preventing erosion. And so you want to have a very thickly planted shoreline. If you still want to see the water, that's fine. Just plant plants that are shorter. You don't have to plant trees along your entire shoreline, though I recommend it. It helps to block out algae, it helps to improve water quality, provide habitat for birds and other animals. And if you just look at how drastic the erosion is between these two points, where the older trees are and the newer trees are, that's almost four feet of bank. That's thousands of dollars in terms of property lost to erosion. And it also fills in your pond faster so that eventually you have to dredge it out sooner than you normally would. And erosion is one of the big reasons why people ask me to do habitat restoration projects because they're having erosion. But here's the thing, grass lawns are one of the worst things for the environment. You can pick five different Florida ground covers that you never have to mow, you never have to water, they don't get taller than this, a lot of them also flower and that are better for the environment. Water ecosystems are affected by mowing not because mowing itself is bad. In fact, if you mow down native species, it honestly, a lot of them will grow back very fast. It can help clear out vegetation and prevent, you know, blockages in a lot of areas. And since all wetland ecosystems will eventually fill in, mowing and debris removal is a great way to clear them. However, when you have grass, and I'm talking St. Augustine or invasive grasses right up to the edge, and you're mowing that, that's where the issues come in. That's where you get erosion because that grass isn't good to hold down that shoreline because oftentimes shorelines in Florida are a steep drop off instead of a slow decline in. Because when you get that slow decline, you can't mow that. You have to do other methods of removal. Um, a lot of these grasses require a high amount of fertilizer and nutrient pollution is one of the biggest forms of pollution Florida is facing. And not just pollution from fertilizers, but also the oil from the mowing um, there's uh, just dust and gunk and all the debris from stormwater and just rain coming down that's supposed to be filtered as the water moves towards the pond. However, if you just have grass and it's just a very small thin layer about like that, it's not going to do a good job of filtering out those pollutants. It's not going to slow down that stormwater, which is why it's good to have a variety of native vegetation. Some people have tried to go all over the world and get uh, species that either look the best or grow the fastest, but when you put these in ecosystems, sometimes they don't work and you just waste a lot of money and time, or sometimes they work so well they become an invasive species and then they take over the water body and cost sometimes billions of dollars to remove. This right here, this is duckweed. It's a native plant that actually in small amounts will inhibit uh, mosquito growth but in large amounts can cause fish kills because it just smothers everything out. And a lot of uh, retention areas and a lot of land managers have issues with it because they it just grows and nothing controls it, which is why I at Stalking Savvy developed a method of multimodal biological control where I stalk native species that eat problematic things like duckweed, like algae, like um, actually phytoplankton too even. Um, you could stalk all sorts of different native species to control things. Just like you put a snail on a fish tank, Think of the pond as a big fish tank. And obviously, except for the walking catfish, fish don't crawl in.
When local communities face a lot of habitat loss, the first and most major effect is the lack of animals. It's the biggest thing that I notice that people just don't seem to see anymore. In fact, even if you just look on the windshield of your car, you'll notice less bugs. If you go to your local parks, you'll notice less birds, less mammals, less reptiles, less turtles. And you just notice kind of less of everything, and every year it seems like there's a little bit less. And that's because animals need these natural hideaways to get to. And they need native plants and native vegetation, they need native fish or smaller animals to eat. You have to have an ecosystem for these animals. They can't survive on turf grass and an empty pond. And when we dig ponds in a lot of these HOAs and communities, we simply dig a hole. We fill it with water, we put an outfall structure so water can go out, but it can't go in, and we call it a day. In fact, the only animal or plant in most of Florida you're required to put in is a mosquito fish. And that does a good job of eating mosquitoes, but it's not an ecosystem. And so when people try to stock bass in these ponds, they end up small or stunted because there's no food. Um, they're surprised when they get algae growing because, you know, there's nutrients in the soil, there's nutrients in the air, but mosquito fish don't eat algae. And if they're the only thing in the pond, of course you're going to get algae growth. You don't have any plants competing with them for those nutrients. And especially if you're putting nutrients on your soil and your lawn, that will wash into the water and grow even faster because there's nothing to compete with it. You will get something growing in your pond and you can choose whether it's a beautiful flower and a native vegetation or algae. It's not rocket science, it's really just algae science. So behind me is a mixture of eelgrass, duckweed, and algae. And it's a symptom of a pond with either too much nutrients or not enough herbivores. So plants will grow in a pond. Algae will grow in a pond. That's just a given. But when you have too much plant growth, you start to get these large mats. And as beneficial plants decay, they will release their nutrients and that oftentimes turns into algae or washes out to farther downstream watersheds. Usually if you have a diverse assemblage of plants and a bunch of different species, they'll help filter and control one another. You know, if one plant starts to get too dominant, um, a parasite or a disease might come in and help knock it back down. However, one good way to help reduce the total amount of plants and algae in a pond is what I do at Stocking Savvy, where we stock fish, we stock native snails, we stock turtles, and turtles are actually one of the biggest herbivores in fresh water. In fact, a single cooter turtle, 90% of its diet is algae, and they can eat several, you know, up to a pound a day. They are very voracious feeders, and they'll eat tons of algae, tons of plant life, and so having a diverse group of herbivores and planktivores, you can actually filter plankton out of the water body with mussels, with shad, some fish species will do it, and having lots of small micro filter feeders. The big thing that I do when I'm doing restoration projects is if it's a newly developed area, I'll actually plant and stock microbes, then I'll go back through and I'll put in larger invertebrates and small fish, and then medium to large fish, and sometimes I won't even put in bass or big predators at all if I don't want fishing, because that way you have more herbivores and less top predators. Because you'll always get birds and gators and stuff, but the more herbivores you have in a pond and the more they go wild, the less vegetation you'll have to compete with. But you still want some vegetation. This is an example of too many nutrients and too much underwater vegetation, so you want something to help eat that. So algae is a really broad term in Florida. And there are hundreds of different kinds of algaes, bacteria, and dinoflagellates that are all generally lumped under something called the harmful algae bloom. Some of these are non-toxic algaes, and they're just, you know, like the little green specks you see in the water, or like little green mats of algae. And in small amounts, they're fine. They're the basis of the ecosystem. They're what everything from whales to small fish to even some birds eat. But in high amounts, even non-toxic algaes can be bad. They form these large mats or cloud up the water so much that other plants can't grow, or they suck, or when they die, whether from people spraying them or just natural deaths, such as in wintertime, they suck all the oxygen out of the water, and that kills native vegetation and fish by just the decay of so much material at once. Um, other harmful algae blooms are like red tide. Everyone knows red tide, and that's known as the it's Karenia brevis, and it's very toxic. And while the link between nutrient pollution and red tide is unclear, because red tide can start without any nutrient inputs, we do see a lot of linkages between other harmful algaes and nutrient inputs, such as trichodesmium, such as lingbia, such as many of the other algaes that you will see. And some of these are known to feed red tide. 
and um, Moat Marine, one of the biggest algae um, experts in Florida, has stated that while nutrient pollution does not cause red tide, it can aggravate it in inshore waters. Where do people live? Inshore waters, that's the place where it matters most. And so if we're not dealing with it in inshore waters, that's the place where most of the bioactivity is, it doesn't matter what's happening in deep water where it develops. We need to, you know, reduce nutrient pollution. And even if nutrient pollution had nothing to do with red tide, the Sarasota Water Quality Summit stated that even if nutrient pollution had nothing to do with these big algae blooms, we should still improve water quality and clean it up for all the other benefits we get. We get cleaner water. And when you have clearer water, that improves property values. Clean water lets you see the birds, fish, wildlife walking in the water or swimming underneath it. And that is one of the biggest drivers of tourism in Florida. If you count under environmental tourism, fishing and kayaking, which I think we all can agree is an environmental thing because you're not gonna fish your kayak in a dead pond, it is the number one reason people come to Florida and where most of our tourism is from. Birding is a multi-million dollar industry in Florida, and these birds require healthy habitats, and algae blooms can severely hamper this. In fact, um, I just talk about Sarasota a lot because I'm from there, but Sarasota had a 10% drop in our tourism during the 2016 and 2017 algae blooms. And these algae blooms are starting to last longer because all algae blooms rely on a few things. Nutrient pollution, well, nutrients in general, not just pollution, but all sorts of nutrients, such as dead fish, smaller uh, plankton, just nutrients floating in the water, Saharan dust, all sorts of things can contribute to these blooms. They also require heat. They generally like warm, shallow water, with the exception of red tide. That's a weird one, and we could do a whole lecture on that. So, as I was just saying, one of the biggest um, reasons why we're researching algae while we're trying to fight algae is because of the negative economic impacts. We all know red tide is bad for Florida's economy, but habitat restoration is one of the biggest ways we can fight red tide because not only does it fight climate change, which is what many scientists believe is one of the big drivers of algae blooms because you have more CO2 and more heat, both of which help fuel algae, but it also helps reduce nutrient inputs, which is the second big thing, and you just have more things in the water eating algae. And so in addition to just stopping the algae blooms and fighting it, habitat restoration has so many other benefits. It increases property values. A single tree can add tens of thousands of dollars to a property while also shading out the water, filtering the water, and providing habitat for many of the birds and wildlife that we see. And since just birding alone is a multi-million dollar industry and fishing in Florida is a multi-billion dollar industry, there are obviously economic incentives to do habitat restoration, to use native plants, to restore these habitat Habitats. And sometimes it's in ways you don't even think. Such as farming is something that a lot of people don't think is a cause of environmental pollution, is a cause of nutrient pollution, and farming is one of the big bad guys of red tide. However, farming relies on healthy habitats more than you would think. Many farms are, many crops in general, aren't pollinated by bees, or they are. There's so many different species of pollinators. Florida has over 400 species of butterflies alone, and each pollinator requires a specific native plant. And if you don't have native plants in your backyards, in your HOAs, in your local community, those pollinators don't exist there. And that means there's less pollinators for your crops, and that drives food prices up. In fact, in some parts of the world where pesticide usage is rampant, there aren't enough pollinators to pollinate human crops. And this requires them to pay people to go out and hand pollinate crops. In fact, vanilla is a very interesting plant. It's an orchid, and it's only pollinated by one species of bee. That bee is extinct. All vanilla plants are pollinated by hand by people, and it's a very arduous process, as any horticulturist can tell you. It sucks. You're trying to pollinate a tiny little flower with your hand and not break it. It's labor intensive. It's one of the reasons why real vanilla is so expensive. And now multiply that times almost everything you eat. And even if something doesn't rely on pollinators, it might rely on predators of pests. And a lot of predators of pests rely on eating pollinators as part of their diet. You don't want a bunch of weevils coming in and eating all your food, if, and the only thing that eats the weevils are the birds or some small mammals or lizards, and they also rely on eating butterflies and bees. It's an ecosystem. Everything is connected. All fresh water leads to the ocean. That's why cleaning up fresh water is the best way to fight red tide. 
And where does fresh water come from? The sky. It rains down on us, but it rains down onto our houses, our yards, our HOAs, our businesses, everywhere. And unless you have native plants helping to filter that stormwater, provide home for all these animals that we still rely on to a great extent, contributing untold trillions to our economy, it's just so much more beneficial to protect these pollinators. And it looks good too. For instance, Florida native plants, canna lilies, great at filtering water, are a host and pollinator plant for the Brazilian skipper butterfly. Get big orange flowers about this big. Or if anyone's eaten passion fruit, and I personally love a good passion fruit beer, one of the biggest plants that grows passion fruit is the maypop passion vine. And that is also the host plant for the Florida state butterfly, the zebra longwing. Not only can you eat the plant, but it gets big purple flowers the size of my fist that are the coolest flowers you've ever seen. It also feeds us, provides home for pollinators, provides food for birds. It's so many resources from one plant, and that's only one plant of thousands. Large scale ecosystem restoration across all areas and walks of life is one of the best things we can do to not only just fight red tide, but climate change, pollution, improve air quality. You can take your pick of what cause you're for and habitat restoration will help it. If you wanna help underprivileged people, underprivileged people tend to live in areas where the environment is worst. They tend to rely most on the environment, whether it's to help clean the air because it's polluted or to provide food because they go fishing or they are gatherers. Sometimes people still rely on gathering in some areas of the world and habitat restoration can help with that. And the best part is when I say native species, it doesn't matter where you live. You just plant and use and stock native species to that region. You don't need to travel all over the world. If you're in Florida, plant Florida plants. If you're in New York, plant North New York plants. If you're in Africa, if you're in South America, if you're in Asia, if you're in Australia, it doesn't matter where you live. Just use native plants and native species for a native ecosystem. If I were to pick one thing for local people, local groups, local HOAs, even local governments to do, it is to plant native plants to your region. If you're going to stock fish, use native fish. Whatever you're doing outside your house, if you're not eating it and it's not native, don't plant it. It doesn't matter how big your area is. I've seen people take a four by four porch area and turn it into a butterfly garden with over eight species. It's not hard. All butterflies need is a host plant, which is what the caterpillar eats, like a milkweed for monarch butterflies, and then a pollinator plant, which is any plant that's native that flowers. They're finding that a lot of non-native plants, a lot of pollinators can't reach or use because they didn't evolve with it. They haven't been around it, they don't know how to use it, or might not have the right nutrients for them. There's a ton of different reasons why not to use native plants and thousands of reasons to use them. So it doesn't matter how small your area is or if you're a local government, just use native plants in all your landscaping. If you're a business, turn your business front into a landscape or have a rooftop garden where you can eat from it. And if you can plant native edible plants, that's twice as good. If you're planting um, edible plants that are not invasive, like banana can never be invasive no matter where you have it, that's perfect because some plants just have no tendency to be invasive, they can't reproduce without humans, whereas some plants will take over and they cost billions in the local economy, and two out of every three invasive species were brought by homeowners, and some of these have billion dollar price tags like water hyacinth. That was brought by a homeowner to Florida in the 1860s. It's over a billion dollars to control in America alone. It is an absolute nightmare for land managers to deal with. So no matter who you are, no matter whether you're an HOA, an individual, a broke college student in a dorm room, native plants and edible plants are the way to go. So the health impacts of a lot of these environmental issues such as red tides, such as freshwater, al harmful algae blooms like microcystins or lumbia can be wide ranging. When there's a sewage break um, in coastal water, sometimes that can release necrotizing fasciitis, which is a flesh-eating bacteria. You don't really have to explain the effects of flesh-eating bacteria. It means you can no longer swim in that water, you can no longer drink from that water, you have to wait for that outbreak to go away. 
for red tide which can cover the coast of multiple states or in fact sometimes countries around the world because not only Florida deals with red tide, Japan and China also have fairly regular red tide blooms. That can cause a lot of respiratory distress in humans and a lot of people are like, well, it mostly just kills fish. It also kills manatees and dolphins and they're air breathers. If you're out swimming in a hard, harsh enough red tide bloom, it can give you permanent neurological or lung related issues. In fact, I was at a beach um, talk one time where people were just coming out and they were talking about how bad the red tide was. Everyone was coughing, hacking. It was terrible. It was a stupid idea to have a talk about red tide during a red tide at the beach and county officials and gas masks actually came and escorted us away because it was that dangerous to human health. And if you think, well, I'm far away from the ocean, I'll just go swim in freshwater. There's no red tide there. Well, that's where you get things like microcystins and lingbia, which can have all sorts of different bacteria, which can make you sick. They can cause a fish kill. And of course, rotting flesh is dangerous. It's disgusting and it carries lots of bacteria. And that necrotizing fasciitis, I believe there are strains in fresh water as well if the water quality is poor enough. So it doesn't matter what kind of issue there is, if the environment and the habitat gets bad enough, if it's polluted enough, it can be a whole host of things, whether it's heavy metals causing cancer, whether it's red tide causing neurological and lung issues, whether it's simply flesh eating bacteria eating off your flesh. And the best thing to help combat this is habitat restoration and keeping the environment healthy. If you care about habitat restoration, if you care about your local economy, if you care about the health of yourself and those around you, I, Sean Patton, personally think you should donate, support, endorse Ideas for Us. They're doing a lot of great work, and I think that you know it only takes one person to make a difference, but it's a lot easier if everyone pitches in.